Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. My name is William Hemsworth. Great to be with you. Uh, my guest, best-selling author, speaker, pilgrimage leader, uh, Steve Ray. He also has a great series called Footprints of God. Fantastic series. I recommend that you check it out. Uh, Steve, how are you doing today? Doing good, thanks. Uh, good to be with you again. No, the pleasure's all mine. Thank you very much. And congratulations on the success of the Take and Read Bible Conference. I'm glad to hear about that. <laughs> yeah, we. I had the idea in the middle of the night, said to my wife, we Catholics are intimidated by the Bible. They're, they're, they get sometimes as far as brushing the dust off the cover, but they're not quite sure what to do with that big old scary book. So we had an uh, introduction to the Bible conference, and we had 50 speakers, some of the best in the country, and we had 30,000 people registered to wow. uh, take part in the conference. And it's still there. You can still get involved in it. Just send me an email or go to my website. You can see it, but some people are still, uh, now you have to pay 50 bucks to get on, but it, it was a free conference. It was really good stuff. Well, 50 bucks for all those speakers and talks though, it's still worth it in my opinion. Yep. Yeah, I agree. It <laughs> really is powerful stuff that we did there. It was, it was, it was really good. Now, last year I had you on, we talked about Mary, um, why she's so important. And one of the things you said, and you say it a lot in your other talks about Mary, is that everything, all the titles about Mary teach us something about Jesus as well. And so that's why I wanted to have you on today. Talk about some of the titles of Mary, um, just so we get a better understanding. So Good. Um, one of the big ones, and you've touched on this a lot as well, is Mother of God. Can you talk to us about Mary as Mother of God? That is the key one, actually. In fact, when we did our movie, you just showed a minute ago our movie on Jesus, but the one we did on Mary, I came up with the title of Mary, Mother of God, because all of the other titles and honors flow from that. That is the basic one that all the others flow from. That's what gives her her special recognition and um, all the other titles flow from Mother of God. Well, it's a big topic. I know we're limited to a half an hour and we've got a lot of titles to do. So I'll try to make it brief. No, right. My, when I was a Protestant, we could not say mother of God. We would say mother of Jesus. We uh, kind of thought that mother of God meant that Mary was the mother of the Trinity. And obviously that couldn't be. So to say Mary's the mother of God is, is incorrect theology. But in fact, by the early church's estimation, if you could not say Mary was the mother of God, it proved you were a heretic. If you wanted to be a heretic, just say Mary's the mother of Jesus and not the mother of God, and it would cause a problem. And in 431, at a council in Ephesus, and the reason they had, this is the third ecumenical council of the Catholic Church. The reason they had it there was because they knew Mary had lived there with John, who was a bishop in Ephesus, and Mary had lived there with him. So they had a church, big church, and they called a council there. Nestorius said that Jesus was something other than who he was, the two natures of Christ and two wills and so on. I'm not going to go into all that detail now. And they decided that the council decided that they would call Mary, give her the official title of Theotokos. And in Greek, Theos is God, Tokos is bearer, the, the one who bears God as in giving birth. If you could not say that Mary was the Theotokos or the God bearer, or the way we say it in English is mother of God, then you were a heretic. That statement is more about who Jesus is than who Mary is. Because when you say Mary is the mother of God, you're saying that he is God. But, if you, but by being virtue of her being his mother, he's also human because he's a baby of a human mother, but he is God. So you're saying, oh, oh there must be two natures here. He's 100% God because he came from this woman, but he's 100% God. I'm sorry, 100% man because he came from this woman, but he's 100% God because he is a virgin birth and that was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. So he is both God and man. Therefore, she is the mother of God. It does not mean that she's the mother of the Trinity. It means that she gave birth to a divine person. We got to remember Jesus has two natures, human and divine but he only has one person. He's not two people. He's only one person and he is a divine person. He is the second person of the Trinity who came down as God and took on human form. So he's, he is God and he is human in the, in the form he took on. So he is both, but he's only one person. He is a divine person. Mary was his mother. 
She is therefore the mother of a divine person, Jesus. Yeah, and I think that's a key point because if you say he's, he's on, she's only the mother of Jesus, well, when did the divine nature come in? And that leads into all kinds of other issues like you, you touched on. The heresies swirled in the first 500 years. That was a time of development of doctrine and even Protestants who don't like Catholic theology and so on, well, I'm making fun here a little bit, but even the Protestants depend upon the Catholic theology that was hammered out in the councils of the church with the, uh, the authority and the delegation of the Bishop of Rome and the final sanct, uh, the final setting, agreeing to those things by the Bishop of Rome. And we don't find the word Trinity in the Bible. We don't find anywhere where it says the, the two natures of Jesus, he was both God and man. We see hints of those like puzzle pieces. The bishops and the councils put those puzzle pieces together. And as a Protestant, I depended upon what they came up with and I didn't invent it myself. But uh, this was a product of the theology of the Catholic church. Now, one of the other titles for our Blessed Mother is the New Eve. And some sometimes this trips people up. Can you explain that term for us? That is also a key one, and it ties in with her sinlessness and uh, her participation in the redemption. There's a lot of ways to look at this, and I'm thinking of the best way to begin. But the New Eve... I'll start with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Romans also speaks of Jesus as the first, I mean, the, the last or the new Adam. Jesus is the new Adam. Well, if he is the new Adam, then the first question is, who's the first Adam? Well, it's Adam in the garden. Jesus is coming now to start a new humanity. He's coming and a fulfillment of that. Adam was the first. He is a type, what's called a type. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. It's interesting when you look at that, and I'm building up to the part about Mary being the new Eve, but we got to lay the foundation of Jesus sure. being the, um, the, the last Adam, because that's twice is in the Bible, in the New Testament. So it's not something we just kind of whizzed out of air, you know, created. Mm -hmm. And if you think about this, when John tells us about the um, Garden of Gethsemane and the crucifixion and burial of Jesus, all four Gospels tell us that the Garden of Gethsemane, it all began, the passion began in a garden. And there's a reason for that. And if you just think about it for a minute, you'll get a ding, ding, ding. John goes far either further and tells us that Jesus was crucified and buried in a garden. And if you don't get it, first time around he does it even more so he, he says who did mary magdalene mistake jesus for the gardener so if you didn't get it the first time around he kind of comes at you again kind of hint hint she thought he was the gardener working in the garden hoeing the weeds right well jesus is the new adam he's in a new garden and there's a tree well in the first garden there was a tree of life and the first Adam brought about death at the tree of life. The new Adam is bringing about life at the tree of death. It's the opposite. The first Adam and Eve were naked in their innocence in the garden and because of sin had to be clothed and kicked out. The new Adam comes clothed into the garden and then is stripped naked at the tree of death in order to restore the innocence. So you see the parallels between the first Adam in a garden at a tree, and not only that, but an angel came and lied to them, and they believed the word of the angel. The new one comes, and there's an, also a devil there, and uh, he lies, and they don't fall for his lie. And the angel comes this time. It's a good angel, and they believe the good angel, and especially in Mary's annunciation. So you have this parallel. Now, the question the early church father said is, if we have a new Adam, who's the new Eve? If there's a parallel here, well, then we're, let's complete that parallel. Well, they said that Mary was the new Eve and that the Eve in the Garden of Eden, she tied the knot of sin. The new Eve in a new garden, she unties the knot of sin. I'm going to show you an icon in just a second. Sure. I always forget to bring this over here, but this is my, <laughs> my wife's favorite uh, devotion to Mary. 
as the untire of knots. Because the first Eve in a garden tied the knot of sin, got us all tangled up in a big knot. The second Eve, she doesn't come. She's not the source of the forgiveness of our sins. That's her son. But just like Eve participated in the fall, Mary participated in the redemption. And she was there as the new Eve to untie the knot of sin. So you have a new Eve in a new garden. And that the parallelism is amazing. Now, let's go back to the new Eve a little bit more. We talk about her being sinless, conceived without sin. Well, if we have a parallel here, what was the first Eve conceived with? She was certainly conceived without sin. And she was made the mother of all the living of the first humanity without sin. She fell into sin and brought condemnation and sin into the world well, in cooperation with Adam. Now we're going to start a new humanity. Jesus, God could have said, you know what? Those stupid people, those stupid people, don't they realize what they did? I'm just going to let them rot in their sin. They deserve it. Let them rot. The sin will catch up with them and they'll just destroy them. Or I could um, just wipe them out and start all over again. Just start over with two new Adam and the new Eve. But he loved what he created. When he created everything, he said, it is good, it is good, it is good. And on the sixth day, he said, it is very good. And he loves Adam and Eve, and he loved our bodies. He loved man and woman made in his image. So he decides on a third alternative to restore them. It's like an artist, you know, if the art gets ruined. You can either throw the art away or just let it rot. But no, he's going to Adam comes. And he's going to restore, start a new humanity. And the new Eve is there with him. And they're going to recreate the new humanity. So between the two of them now, the first Eve was sinless, conceived without sin. So it's only proper and fitting that the new Eve also be without sin. So that she can also now be the mother of a new humanity that's not tainted by sin. So here you've got the new Eve and that, that topic, the fathers of the church, one more point on that. And I know we're sure. running out of time already. Oh, you're fine. Uh, but one thing that the father said, it, it's really quite amazing because when one of the things that really impacted me, in fact, it was maybe the major thing to help me get over and understand who Mary was. And by the way, I learned more about Mary and um, came to more conclusions about Mary from the old Testament than I did from the new as we're talking about now. So Mary as the new Eve, you would think that, well, who came up with that doctrine? I mean, that seems kind of, well, first of all, the parallelism between Adam being Jesus, the new Adam, the fathers of the church, and they, I believe it was apostolic. I don't believe that it was even the fathers of the church that came up with that. I think it was an apostolic teaching. And here's why. Because they didn't have Facebook and Twitter and post offices and all of that means of communication. Like you and I are doing this. Bam, we're doing it right now. You're in Tucson, Arizona. I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we're far away. But the communication is unbelievable what we can do today for good and ill. Now, back in those days, that communication wasn't that way. And when you start even at the end of the first century and into the second century, you have Origen, who's down in Palestine or Israel area, talking in great detail about Jesus and Mary as the new Eve and Adam. You have Irenaeus way up in the area of Gaul, which is France of today talking about it. You have um, Tertullian, in Rome talking about it, you've got the, the three major, and ter, also Tertullian in North Africa, uh, in North Africa they're talking about. So you've got all the extent of the empire writing about Mary, the new Eve, how she untied the knot of sin, and she corresponds to the sinful Mary in the garden. She's now the, the sinless Mary, also immaculately conceived, but without sin starting a new humanity. And these, these fathers in the first and second century are writing about this, not as a novelty, not as something they are creating, not some new, hey, I got this new idea. What do you think about this? Tell, tell you what, William, I got this new idea. What, uh, let me bounce it off you and see what you think. See, they, it wasn't that way. They were teaching as though this was already well established in the three or four corners of the of the Roman empire where Christianity had spread. And in order for it to be that far and that well-established, it has to be apostolic. 
I'm right. convinced that just like Paul wrote twice, Romans and 1 Corinthians, about Jesus being the new Adam, it was understood as apostolic that Mary was the new Eve, and that message went out with the gospel. They didn't even have a New Testament yet at that time. They were still teaching what they had heard the apostles say. That's a good point. And when, when I first read about the new Eve, I was reading um, Against Heresies by St. Irenaeus when I was a Protestant. I was like, wait, hold on. This is like Catholic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Where did, how did he get corrupted by Catholic stuff that early? <laughs> so I was like one of those God smack moments, you know? Yeah. And let's just face it, who Irenaeus is. Jesus taught John. Yeah. John taught Polycarp. Polycarp taught Irenaeus. Yeah. Irenaeus says that when I was a boy, I sat at the feet of Polycarp when he told me of his friendship with John and all the things John had told him about what he had seen Jesus do. This is how close they are. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing when you, when you think about it and think about those degrees of separation. Now, an, another title, a Seed of Wisdom. Now, some... Some aren't too familiar with it, and a lot of people are. Can you tell us about that one? <laughs> that one I'll just do a minute on, but sure. Jesus comes from Mary. And in the Old Testament, wisdom is personified. Wisdom creates. Wisdom um, does things. And, and wisdom is, in the Old Testament, when you look back, it's a personification of Jesus. He is the wisdom of God. He is the word of God. It was through him that all things were created. Yes, God the Father created everything, but it was through Christ and for Christ, who in the Old Testament, when you read through many passages of scripture, even in Proverbs and others, where it talks about wisdom, the wisdom of God went out and did this. The wisdom did this and created that. All of the things were created by wisdom. And you put those two together, you realize that when wisdom in that context is being used as a person, it's referring to the second person of the Trinity being the kind of the creative force of God, the voice God said, and it was. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. And Mary is the seed of wisdom. In other words, he's sitting on her lap. She is the source of him coming into the world. She is the one who brought him into the world. She's the queen mother. We'll talk about that too, kind of with the child sitting seated on her lap. The most common picture we see of Mary is not the untire of knots. If you think of images, icons, pictures, paintings, statues of Mary, it's always with her holding a baby, the baby Jesus signifying that she is the mother of him and her lap is the seat of wisdom. All right. makes sense. Now, since you brought it up, um, queen of heaven. <laughs> queen now, of heaven is another good one too. And that all comes also from mother of God. Yep. That also flows right without mother of God. There's no queen of heaven. And this comes, I think the first time Mary, it dawned on her was at the Annunciation in Luke chapter 1, when the angel said, you are going to give birth to a son, and he will be seated on the throne of his father, David. First of all, there had not been a king on the throne of David for over 600 years. 586, the tribe of Judah, the last remaining Israelites, they got the name Jew because they are from Judah. The last tribe was taken into Babylon and the kings ended. That's 586 BC. Mary's hearing this 600 later, 600 years later, that she's going to give birth to the son who's going to sit on the throne of his father, David, the first king in 600 years. I think Mary's first thought after getting over the shock of that was, oh my goodness, I'm going to be a queen. Why would that be? Because in, in Israel, especially the tribe of Judah, when you call Jews, Jerusalem, the king always had a queen, but the queen was never his wife. The queen was always his mother. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's 1,000 women that he was married to. Solomon was a very busy man, but sure. leaving that aside... Solomon had only one mother. And in second and uh, first Kings chapter two, verse 19, people can look it up if they think I'm making this up. First Kings chapter two, verse 19. One of the first things Solomon did as a young king said so his mother walked into the throne room. You never do that. You remember the story of Esther? 
you don't even if you're the Esther was the was the wife of of the you just you don't walk into the I remember giving this talk on Mary in England in London England and I said what would happen if a rel even a relative of the Queen of England just walked right into the throne room and everybody said Pew! they all kind of chuckled you you know yeah. that's what the royal guard is for you know they change it buck the royal guard changing at Buckingham Palace. Christopher Robin went down there with Alice, for people who know their children's poetry there. But the, it, you, you don't just walk into the throne room. And so you have Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, walks into the throne room to make a request. And you would think Solomon would object or the guards would start. What happened was Solomon got off his throne and it said he prostrated himself, said he bowed, but that's the Hebrew word for prostrate on the ground in front of his mother. And then when he sat, there was originally one throne in the throne room. Now he builds two. So there's two thrones now here and here. And he builds a throne at his right hand. And he raises his mother up and seats her on that throne. And from that point on, the queen mother ruled with her son, the king, not just under Solomon. But when you read through the Old Testament, you will see whenever they mention the king, they also said, and his mother and name her. And if a young man happened to rise to the throne when he was only four or five years old, guess who ruled the kingdom until he grew up and who taught him how to rule in the kingdom was the Gebura, which is the Aramaic for the great lady, the queen the queen mother. So every king in Judah, all the way in the line of Jesus, from Solomon on, had a queen, but the queen was always the mother. And she ruled in the kingdom with her son. And she was known as the intercessor of the people. Ding, 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 ding. Does that ring a bell? Mary is the queen of heaven by virtue of being the first title, the mother of God. By being the mother of God, she is by virtue the queen of heaven. Now, if Solomon raised his mother up and seated her at his right hand, do you think Jesus, who is the quintessential king of Israel, would do any less for his mother? And we'll top it off. Go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And it says, Behold, I looked up into the heavens and I saw the woman clothed mm -hmm. with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. That is a Davidic crown, 12 stars. That can only be the crown of Israel because of the 12 tribes. And if it's, and if it's referring to Mary there as the mother of the king, that this is just, it all ties right back in to Mary being the new Eve. Now it also, she is the queen of heaven. And it's right there in Revelation chapter 12, 1. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's, it's it's it just baffles me how it all ties together. And doesn't it also baffle I mean, you how we missed it as Baptists? It, how did we? It, miss it does. It? it does. I was watching your I was watching your show on your on the journey home this morning too. So everyone check it out. It's on YouTube and it's going to be a replay tonight at one a.m. on uh, EWTN. It's about how much things just come to life now that you have this two thousand years of tradition and theology that's built up it's just fascinating like it was right there the whole time <laughs> yep and one of the things is is that theology develops there's a development of theology right. for example the word trinity is not in the bible that came about over the first five centuries as we wrestled with these puzzle pieces we find in the bible and it's i use in my movie mary mother of god i'm sitting at the place where mary was born and i have a red cabbage in my hand and i said it's a development of doctrine you don't hear a lot about mary in the new testament in the first century but as time went on you peel one layer off the cabbage at a time it's like you dig deeper and deeper into the the, the deposit of faith was given to us by jesus and the apostles but it's not all easy to understand there's a lot in there and we've been unpacking that for 2000 years it's like taking the leaves off and cabbage you get deeper and deeper and it's not a different cabbage it's it's the same cabbage jesus gave us but we're just getting deeper and deeper even for protestants the new testament did not get finalized and collected as a development of doctrine until the end of the fourth century mm -hmm. 
they even have to say that they have a development of doctrine and acknowledging because they did not have a New Testament until the end of the fourth century where the Catholic Church declared these 26 books are New Testament. And we're going to use the word Trinity because that's also not in the Bible, development of doctrine. So as Mary, we understood more about Jesus. In order to understand more about him, we had to understand more about her because he's his mother. And Italian is very close. Right. And when we do, there's the development of doctrine. Now, how about mediatrix? Uh, Mary is mediatrix. When, when I was a Protestant and I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, what does this mean? <laughs> First Timothy chapter 215. And um, that um, is, says that there's only one mediator between God and man. I'm going to bring it up, but I know it by heart anyway. So man, Christ Jesus, yeah. <laughs> and um, there's only one mediator between God and man. And you Catholics, you are going to make Mary your mediator. You're gonna to pray to her to get to God. I remember my father telling me, William, when I was on the verge of becoming Catholic, my dad, who is a Baptist deacon, he said to me, Steve, when you become Catholic, you're gonna be praying to Mary. And the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. So you're gonna be disobeying scripture. I just want you to know that son, he told me. So I said, dad, listen to me carefully. When I become a Catholic, don't ever ask me to pray for you again. He said, why not? I said, because as soon as you ask me to pray for you, you're asking me to be a mediator. Because God is up there and you're here. And if you say pray to me for, to, for me, you're asking me to pray to God for you and you just put me in the middle. And when you put me in the middle, that is where the word mediator or mediatrix is simply the feminine of mediator. So you just put me in the middle, dad. You made me a mediator. You just disobeyed scripture. And it works the other way too, because God now says to me, Steve, go help your dad. Well, God now made me a mediator. My dad can go ask God to bless him himself. He doesn't have to ask me to pray for him. He doesn't need me. If Jesus is his only mediator, you go ask Jesus. Don't ask me to pray for you. And Jesus doesn't act that way either because he says to me, Steve, go help your dad. Go pray for your dad. Go bless your dad. Go help your dad or go preach the gospel. Jesus is expecting me to be a mediator, which we also call intercessor, one who's in the middle. A median in a highway is the area of the road that has grass and trees in between the left and right lanes. Of, it's a medium, the mediator. What does it mean that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man? Well, if you think about on this side, you have a holy God, totally holy and separate and transcendent. And over here, there's a big chasm. And on this side is us finite, sinful men who can never get across that chasm to a holy God. There's not a thing that I can do on this side of this big gorge or valley to get up to the top of that mountain where the holy God is. Nothing I can do to get him to accept me. He has to initiate it, and he did so with his divine son. Only the divine son is big enough to cross that gap, to build a bridge across that gap, to come down and reach me so that now I can go across the bridge with him back up to God. He is the only eternal mediator that can do what needed to be done. Now that he's done that, he asks me to share in his ministry. I'm to share in his ministry of sharing the good news. I'm to share in his ministry of prayer. I'm, I'm even a priest. Well, he's the priest, right? Well, how can I be a priest? Even Protestants say we're a nation of priests. Well, how can I be a priest if Jesus is the priest? Because he, in his great generosity, invites us to share everything he has, even his own divine life. I have a icon in the other room. I get it's you, you can't see it but it's right behind me right there it's got see it's right mm -hmm. it's long it's five feet long and it's a foot high and it's a whole piece of a log and it's 500 years old from east germany they smuggled it out of east germany to keep it away from the nazis and a millionaire guy i know bought this 
and a, he died, and gave it to a friend across the street. Friend across the street didn't know what it was and gave it to me. It's probably $30,000. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I didn't buy it. It was a gift. But on there is an amazing two icons. One is an old man with a beard holding a ladder in his hand. And then on the other side, there's Mary holding a baby with angels around her going like this, pointing to her. And I looked at that and studied it. The old man with the ladder is Jacob. And it even has wow. in Greek, the first two letters for Jacob above. And he's holding a ladder. And I realized what this is. Jacob is holding the ladder on which angels went up and down. Jesus says in John chapter 20, uh, verse uh, chapter one at the end, he says, to Nathaniel, oh, so you believed in me just because I saw you sitting under the fig tree? You will see the angels going up and down on the Son of Man. In other words, I'm the new ladder. I'm the new Jacob. So what you have here is this the image just in the other room there. I should carry my laptop in and show it to you, but you have the image of Jacob with the ladder, but there's no angels around him anymore. There's no angels on the ladder. They're all over at Mary and they're doing this to Mary, like pointing to her. Mary is holding the baby. And in the ancient Greek Orthodox literature, it says, oh, divine ladder by which God, you brought God down to us. You are the ladder, Mary. So this is another title of Mary, the ladder. You, oh, great ladder, who brought God down to us and by whom we also will ascend into heaven on this great ladder of Jesus. She brought Jesus to us. He's in heaven. She brought him down in her body to us. And there's the mediatrics of all graces. Mary is a mediator. She's more so a mediator than we are even. She's not the mediator. She only shares. She did the work of a mediator, just like you and I do every day. But she mediated in the sense that she brought him down. She was the middle. She was the ladder that brought him down from heaven down to us to become a man. She, God needed her. I, he could have created another Adam out of the dust, but he wanted Jesus, his son, to be one of us right through uh, her own body be born right in through us and a new create a new Adam right through a, a, the new Eve, so to speak. So here you have this beautiful image of Mary the latter. She is the mediatrix. Now, with, mediatrix doesn't mean that God can't do anything for us and she takes the place of Jesus. That's nonsense. That's not what it means. She is there as a special. She is seated at the right hand of Jesus as the queen, just like any good Jewish king would. And from there, she also serves in the kingdom and she mediates things for us from her son. It's all in the Bible. It's all biblical. I missed it. I, I'm so glad I'm a Catholic now, William. Oh, so am I. That's funny. In your email, you joked that we'll need about six hours and I, no, no doubt. So maybe we get oh, we're already out of time. So maybe we get together at some point, do like a part two or part three, even. Yeah. <laughs> and also the Ark of the Covenant, just for the fun of it. Yep. Here's, this is I always jokingly tell people that this is my statue of Mary. Because Mary is also the Ark of the New Covenant. In here was the word of God inscribed in stone. But in Mary's womb was the word of God inscribed in flesh. She's the new Ark of the Covenant, which is why everything happened with Elizabeth when David had the Ark of the Covenant in the hill country of Judea and said, who am I that the Ark of the Covenant should come to me? Elizabeth in the same place said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And that, and I'll just close with this, that passage oh, sure. in Revelation where it talked, where we said that she was the queen of heaven. Chapters were not added into the Bible until later. When the Bible was written, it was all one complete um, story. We stop at Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, close our Bible, go to bed, get up the next day and open our Bible at Revelation 12, the next chapter, beginning. And it divides something very important. Yes. Because when you read it in the context, it says, John says, and who is John? He is the one who already told us about the new Eve, the one who is the one in the garden. He's the one that Mary lived with for the rest of her life. And I think that Jesus gave him this vision to say, John, see where mom is now? Thanks for taking care of mom. But he, John, it says, I looked into the heavens, Revelation eleven nineteen, and behold, the ark, the, the tabernacle was opened. And behold, I saw the ark of the covenant 
behold, I saw the woman yeah. clothed with the sun. The ark and the woman who is the queen are the same thing. Yeah, I saw the ark. Oh, there is the woman clothed with the sun. Lastly, do Catholics worship Mary with all these titles? No, we do not. This was the most holy piece of utensil in the temple. A man named Uzzah one time tried to, it was going to fall. Oh, and Uzzah reached out to stop it, and he was struck dead by God because he touched a holy thing. Mary is the Ark of the Covenant. Then we ought to also have some real tremendous respect for her if she's the new Ark of the Covenant. But do we as Catholics worship Mary? No. Did the Jews worship the box? No, this is Mary. The Jews didn't worship the box, and we don't worship the new Ark of the Covenant. What did the Jews worship? In their time, there was a billowing cloud above this Ark, and it was the grace, the glory of God. They could see God in a physical form in a cloud called the Shekinah glory over this. And what do we as Catholics see? We see the Ark of the Covenant, and in her womb or in her arms is Jesus, the glory of God revealed. We do not worship the woman. We worship God in her arms. Wow. Amazing stuff. So, Steve, before I let you go, how are, do you have anything else planned? I know last time we talked, you said you had some pilgrimages, pilgrimages planned. Are those still on? They are. They, the two we have in April are kind of iffy. You know, I would have never mm -hmm. dreamed in last year that, it would still be an issue, but Israel is closed and they're making people get vaccines and everything. So the two I have planned for uh, April, we're still hoping work. We're watching real close, but we do have, which I am quite confident of is September, November, and December. And those are filling up fast. So if people want to go to Israel with us, get on those quickly because they're filling up fast. And I can't wait because we're going to have the whole country to ourselves. It's not going to be the huge crowds that were there last year. And we have a St. Paul cruise in October. I'm taking eight of my grandkids. This is going to hit 10 biblical sites in Turkey, Greece, and then the Greek, um, the Mediterranean there where Paul was, had shipwrecks and everything. I, we won't have a shipwreck, I promise you that. <laughs> and then we're also going to take a trip to Ireland, to the uh, Catholic heritage of Ireland, and also Lourdes and Fatima with a great oh, wow. priest. We're going to go through Portugal, Spain, and France, all these Marian sites for 10 days, uh, emphasizing lords and, and fatima so we got those going and um, i'm getting back on the speaking trail again so if somebody wants uh, men's conferences conference speakers parish missions give go on my website catholicconvert.com and i have a section there about my talks and speaking engagements and pilgrimages and everything else so we're getting back on the road again here william right, real good. soon all right good well steve thanks for spending some time to talk about some marian titles and clearing up some misconceptions Always appreciate you having coming on. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Give me a call. Maybe we'll do another one. No, I'll look forward to it. Thanks, right, William. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.